Okay, I'd say that we can start this session. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, third session of the ICAREB Dialogues. This time, we're going to talk about the origins of uh, stone tool use. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is João Cascalheira. I am a researcher here at ICAREB uh, in southern Portugal, where I also coordinate the research line on African archaeology and human evolution. I must say that it's a true pleasure to be here today convening this dialogue, and I am really, really excited for the upcoming talks and all the questions that will certainly come up um, in, during our discussion. Um, for those of you participating for the first time in the ICAREC Dialogues, um, so we always have two presentations with between 25 and 30 minutes um, each uh, that are delivered by two well-known experts on the topic. After the presentations, everyone will have a chance to participate and dialogue with our uh, invited researchers. As in previous sessions, I would like to please ask you to turn your microphones off while we play the presentations. If during the talks you remember of any questions for the speakers, please write them down in the chat room and later during the discussion, I will call your name and you can turn your microphone and your camera on and ask the question directly to the speakers. Otherwise, you can also raise your virtual hand during the discussion and let me know that you want to ask a question or make any comment about the presentations. So today, to tell us about the origins of the stone tool use, uh, we have with us Dr. David Brown as our guest researcher and Dr. João Marreiros as our ICAREB researcher. And before we listen to their talks and we watch their slides, I want to first do a very brief introduction of both of these researchers. And let me start with um, Dr. David Brown. Well, in fact, for those of you who have some interest for early prehistory, probably David's name uh, does, not a lead, does not need a lot of introductions since you probably already know some or maybe all of his amazing top-notch papers. David is currently a professor at the George Washington University in the United States, but has previously held positions at the University of Cape Town, Oxford University, and the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. He has been directing field research in Kenya, Ethiopia, and South Africa, and is a collaborator with projects in Mozambique, Guinea, and the Thailand. Most of his research has been focused on some of the earliest occurrence of stone artifacts in East Africa. He is currently engaged also in projects that involve the impact of paratechnology on the evolutionary history of humans in South Africa and Kenya, and also the ecological consequences of different diet changes uh, in past human populations. He has, I must say, a rather impressive publication record. Um, just out of curiosity, early this morning, I ran a Google Scholar search and I found this profile. Uh, and I found that only last year in 2020, David published close to 30 papers, which is really, really impressive. But what is most impressive is that most of his publications are present in top ranked journals such as Science, Nature, PNAS, just to name a few. So David, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and it, it is a real honor to have you here today with us. Our second speaker today is uh, Dr. João Marreiros. I know João for more than 20 years now, since our high school times. <laughs> yes, we are getting old. Academically, we, are, we have very similar trajectories up to the PhD. Uh, and in fact, we defended both our masters and our PhD dissertations in the same day same room, and we even shared the same supervisor. In 2017, João moved to Germany uh, to lead the lab for traceology and control experiments at the Montrepo Archaeological Research Center. Currently, he is one of the leading experts in lithic use wear analysis, and his research combines projects dedicated to experimental replication of stone tool use and the study of middle and upper paleolithic assemblages. He has also been involved on field research in Bulgaria, Romania, Portugal, Israel, and Armenia. Currently, João is a lecturer at the University of Evra here in southern Portugal, and he's also uh, a researcher at ICAREB. João, thank you also for accepting our invitation. It is always a pleasure to hear about the most recent advances in lithic use wear analysis. So without further ado, I would like to invite you to watch these two very, very interesting presentations 
thank you all very much and I hope you enjoy it as much as I will for sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to talk to you today about the origins of stone tool use. I was really excited to participate in this talk series, largely because of the exciting line of the different speakers. I've watched the other talks, and it's, they've set a quite a high bar for a lot of different interesting topics. I was also excited, honestly, about the prospect of giving this talk in beautiful Faro, but I suppose that'll have to wait for another day. Instead, I come to you in sunny downtown DC, and I'm particularly interested in giving this talk today because of all the new and exciting developments that have happened in this field. There was a time when people used to say the early part of the Stone Age record was frankly kind of boring. But I hope to convince you over the next sort of 20 to 25 minutes that um, that's no longer the case. And we have a lot of new and interesting developments in this field. The study of the evolution of human technology is so exciting because it allows us to pull together all of the things that make us human, which includes details of anatomy, diet, as well as components of cognition, and even our genetic makeup. I want to begin with a description of how we know about early technology and how it's changed in the last decade. Then I want to talk about why it is fundamental to understand aspects of technology and especially the earliest onset of tool use. Then I want to refer to how technology is understood and the origins of stone tools relative to the context of the biology of the hominins that existed at that time. And finally, I want to end with a sort of model for the technological origins of our species. Now, to begin with, I want to begin with a sort of model of what we thought human technological evolution looked like around about 2009. This is a simplified version of a hominin fossil and archaeological record. Now, though it's not clear who is the indicator or who is the responsible for the earliest archaeological record, the prevailing view was that it was probably some form of early homo or one of the predecessors of early homo. By 2009, the publication of the Hadar palette and the presence of cut marks at places like Gona and Bori indicated that some form of early Homo or the end of Australopithecus was responsible for the earliest stone tools. Generally, the perception was that this was a feedback loop where stone tools allowed access to higher quality dietary items. And then in turn, this resulted in larger brains and eventually a reduction in dental apparatus. By 2009, this story seemed pretty much codified in paleoanthropology. This general model of technological origins received a rude awakening in 2010 with the publication of cut mark bones as old as 3.3 million years old at the site of Dikika in the Afar region of Ethiopia. This suggested that some of the earlier members of the genus Australopithecus were actually using stone tools and accessing higher depth higher quality dietary items. Then in 2015, the presence of stone tools at the site of Lomaqui suggested that Australopithecus could also make sharp edged stone tools. It should be noted there is a significant controversy regarding both the sites of Dikika and Lomaqui, but yet this did open archaeologists' eyes that tool use may extend deeper than we had previously thought. This also makes the identification of the hominin responsible for the origin of tool use a much more complex question. It also forces us to ask the question, what is the actual adaptive significance of stone tool use? This is thrown even into further disarray with the discovery in 2016 that capuchins in Brazil produce sharp edged flakes that appear very similar to what hominins produce. These monkeys are not producing these tools to make sharp edges. And it also forces us to ask the question, does the presence of sharp edge stone tools necessarily implicate the kind of major evolutionary changes that we often associate with the onset of chip stone tool use? 
Before I go further, we should note that these are the same questions that have been posed for quite some time. Although Isaac did not have the same amount of information about the fossil records, he sought to find connections between biological and technological events in the paleontological record. His research was mostly focused on major evolutionary events in paleontology. And Isaac felt that the appearance of stone tools was often what he referred to as a watershed moment in human evolution. His idea was that once humans produced sharp-edged stone tools, they dramatically changed their ecology and that set them on the path of technological dependence ever since. The recent discoveries of Lomaqui and Dikika, and the subsequent discoveries of capuchin stone tool production, call into question this model of a watershed moment and make us have to think more clearly about what does it mean when sharp edge tools are produced. To understand the adaptive significance of the origins of tool use, we really need to understand why tool use is fundamental to human behavior. Some have suggested that stone tools reflect components of human behavior that are uniquely human, most notably the ability for humans to transfer information between individuals with high fidelity. This is key to our evolutionary success, but the timeline of when this uniquely human capacity appeared is poorly understood. We also know that our dependence on technology begins to influence our biology through changes in our diet, but the onset of this is poorly understood. Furthermore, we know that these changes in technology and diet are inextricably linked to environmental changes, but how is not really well known. The cognitive basis for our ability to use culture as an adaptation is really derived from our unique capacity to transfer information with high fidelity. Information is transferred as such an important component of what we are as humans, so we really need to understand the temporal extent of that capacity. How far back in time does that go? Potential hypotheses around this origins of stone tools suggest that high fidelity information transfer may have deep roots in human technology. But how do we actually test this? In some instances, we've tried to use the origin of certain types of tool forms as evidence of major transitions in behaviors of ancient hominins. But the archeological record doesn't seem to vary in any recognizable way with the hominin fossil record. The more we learn about the deep time of the archeological record, it's as though the connections between the appearance of hominin taxa and archeological occurrences are more and more tenuous. Right now, there are few recognizable events in the archaeological record that correspond with speciation events in the hominid record. This suggests that the origin of certain tool forms may have little to do with the selective fitness of hominids. Sometimes archaeologists try to use the presence or absence of different major iconic forms to try to determine whether or not these are reflective of different levels of information transfer. This kind of research builds upon controlled experiments to understand about the details of which of these forms might have reflections in cognitive capacity for information transfer. It'd be really useful to understand how these forms are made and what particular context to understand the evolutionary mechanisms that drive the changes in technology. But how do we identify aspects of social learning in the archaeological record? Most of the times these changes that we see as reflected in the images on the left are described as different levels of information transfer, sometimes described as imitation or emulation, with imitation being considered a sort of uniquely human capacity and the ability to teach as something that doesn't exist elsewhere in the animal behavioral record. But it would be really useful to understand if any of these specific forms of artifacts actually reflect levels of information transfer as indicated by sort of some type of imitation or emulation. It may be fruitful to then identify the strength of social learning. And it has been suggested that more intense levels of social learning should be associated with increases in homogeneity within a group. Now, identifying groups in the archaeological record is, well, frankly, it's impossible, especially in deep time. 
So investigating group variants is probably pretty difficult. However, one way to do this is by looking at variation in artifact production within a refit set. Refit sets are pieces of stone that fit back together again, and so they basically show instances of a single instance in time. Now, variation with these refit sets might give us a sense into the variation that existed in behaviors of individuals in the past. In this record of behavior from 2 million years ago from the Turkana Basin, you can see on the left-hand side here, you can see there's quite a bit of variance within refit sets. Later in time, the variance within these refit sets decreases dramatically. This is tantalizing indications of suggesting that increases in information transfer can be identified through time. However, it needs substantially more data to be able to support this. The nice part about this is that refits are something we can find throughout the archaeological record, from the old one all the way up to the later Stone Age. So it's possible to actually look at patterns throughout the technological record and understand the general patterns happening through time. It is important to note that these kinds of hypotheses are built on inferences developed from experiments in animal behavior. And so really understanding how it transfers over to human behavior is something that we still need to figure out. But how else can we use aspects of the archaeological record to understand changes in the fidelity of information transfer? We tend to use the form of artifacts as a way of measuring whether or not uh, objects reflect uh, high levels of information transfer, but that's not all that tools are. Um, we also know that there are a variety of behaviors that are not just associated with the structure of the form of artifacts. So maybe there's other aspects of tool use that we might be able to find details of high fidelity information transfer in. One behavior that is evident throughout the archeological record is selection. We know that early humans are really good at selecting certain types of rocks to make stone artifacts, usually rocks that are particularly good, useful to make artifacts out of. And you can see on the right-hand side, this is selectivity values for every known archaeological site where we know something about the numbers of types of rocks that have been collected and what was available. This is a sort of universally identifiable feature of the earliest technology. So maybe this reflects some kind of information transfer. Unfortunately, using models of selection based on modern humans is difficult because almost no modern humans made and used stone artifacts as part of their daily lives. They're understanding of, be, of selection is basically driven by what they've learned from others. Um, it's not necessarily reflective of what might have happened in the past. However, modern primates provide an essential tool for understanding variation behavior. Chimpanzees, use, as well as other primates, use tools in their sort of daily extractive foraging behaviors. So we can maybe explore patterns of selection in chimpanzees to understand levels of information transfer that might exist in ancient humans. Chimpanzee stone tool use is actually really useful as an analog. Um, this behavior requires an extensive period of learning. Um, it takes quite some time for, for, for young chimpanzees to learn how to crack nuts. And lots of studies have documented that chimpanzees use a variety of different rock types and that they select certain rock types for, cert for, for certain types of nut cracking behavior. So it's possible that we can use nut cracking as a sort of model for understanding information transfer in the past. Uh, how chimpanzees learn to select stones may provide some kind of model to simulate information transfer in the early parts of the behavioral record of hominids. To explore this pattern, I worked with colleagues Susanna Carvalho and Dora Biro from Oxford University and also at Ecored um, to look at patterns of selection in uh, a group of chimpanzees that crack nuts in West Africa in the country of Guinea. One of the things we wanted to figure out was whether or not these chimpanzees could explore and understand the features or the mechanical properties of rocks um, that exist in the groups of rocks that they've never seen before. So to do this, 
we wanted to, to actually transport rocks from East Africa, and specifically rocks that we knew a lot about their mechanical properties. So these are rocks that were actually used at the site of Kanjira South in Western Kenya to make stone tools. Um, and we selected uh, rocks from that region, transported them over there so we could be very certain that these rocks uh, were, had never been seen before, that the shims were naive to them. Furthermore, many of these rocks have very similar surficial properties. They look very similar, but they actually have very different mechanical properties. So it would be possible to start to understand how it is that chimpanzees begin to understand sort of internal rock properties just by looking and using some of these stone tools. Over the course of the experiment, we saw that both adults and juveniles rapidly learn to use the most efficient combination. Um, the using, you actually have to use a very hard rock as a hammer and a very soft rock as an anvil to get the most efficient combination of nut cracking. Should note that it actually took uh, this group less time to figure this out than it took me to remember their names. So uh, it was actually quite quick. But they converge on a select set of stones, and that pattern happened over and over and over again. And if we restricted our study to only the rocks that they selected, we'd be left with a really limited group of rock types. And that's really what would be sort of analogous to what we see in the archaeological record. So the patterns that we see in the chimpanzee record at Basu, based on a very short window of time of selection, actually somewhat mirror what we see in the archaeological record in, in Eastern Africa. And this argues that some of the behaviors that we see in the archaeological record may actually reflect relatively simple forms of information transfer. These studies highlight the utility of the study of modern primates to help us understand behaviors in the past. However, as we've recently published, tool use amongst modern primates is distinctly different from much of the old one. Tools used by modern primates tend to have a much higher frequency of percussive tools than any industry other than the Lamequian. This highlights the need for us to explore the variety of different tool use traces. Currently, our search image is pretty much only for sharp edged tools. To get a better grasp on the range of tool use that may have existed, we probably need to explore new methods of identifying a variety of different types of tools like percussive tools. I'm working with colleagues at the Max Planck Institute, including Lydia Luntz, to try and explore, explore some of these patterns seen on percussive tools using modern primate tools as an example and then applying those patterns to what we see in the past. Previously, we've used techniques that are usually used with geospatial technologies, basically creating 3D surfaces from the surfaces of damaged tools and then applying techniques usually applied to landscapes to these uh, tool surfaces. But now we're beginning to explore the use of machine learning and computer vision techniques to create new ways of identifying these types of features. The image on the right shows a pounding tool, mechanisms that computer vision you can use to identify underlying patterns in the images. They can distinguish damaged versus undamaged portions of the tool. So if percussive tools are such an effective aspect of the tool use in many primates, why make sharp edge tools? Is making sharp edge tools actually that distinct? And when does that begin to appear in the archaeological record in a way that changes the biology of hominins? In other words, is sharp edge flake production really that different or just an extension of earlier percussive tool use? We were recently able to explore this issue at the site of Bakaldura in the Afar Desert in Ethiopia. Locality was discovered in the Leti Gerara research area, and this research area has recovered some of the earliest evidence of the genus Homo and is directed by Kay Reed of the Institute of Human Origins. Over the course of four years, we excavated a large locality and recovered about 300 artifacts. These were laid down on an ancient muddy surface, that surface is about three meters below the modern day surface, and the tools were found clearly in situ above a volcanic ash. The combination of the volcanic ash and paleomagnetics show that the site and the artifacts were probably laid down 
around about 2.65 million years ago, making this the oldest evidence of the old one industry currently known. When we did a factor analysis of the different components of major old one and early Acheulean sites, and included the Lamequian tools, the early 3.3 million tools, and also those made by Capuchins, we found some pretty distinct differences. The biggest difference, beyond just size, is that the old one assemblages do not include any or very little of the percussive activities that you find in both the Lamequian and the Capuchin material. There's also quite a large amount of unifacial flaking that distinguishes the Lamequian from other old one assemblages. If these early old one assemblages are so distinct, it's certainly feasible that there's no direct lineage between the Lamequian and later industries. We can imagine the idea of multiple lineages of early technology with various degrees of percussive and unifacial technology. Eventually, some of these lineages disappear and they may be independently invented. In fact, when we tried to resample the three oldest assemblages that are uh, just younger than the Lamequian to see if any combination of those would, could produce the patterns that we see in the Lamequian, there's really no way to resample the earliest old one assemblages and produce a pattern that looks anything like the Lamequian. At present, it really doesn't seem like it makes sense that the Lamequian represents a precursor to old one technology given our current knowledge base. However, aspects of information transfer aren't the only details about the origins of tool and stone tool use. The changes in our technology in the past also led to distinctive changes in our diet. This used to be the picture of, that we understood between the relationship between diet, brain size, tool use, and uh, dental patterns around about 2005-2009. We now know that tool use may extend much further back in time. Dietary changes may also extend further back in time as well. This really modifies our understanding of the relationship between biology and technology, and it really causes us to seek new explanations for the relationships between these patterns. This makes it really important that we understand the interface between biology technology in our species, going as far back as maybe even the Miocene. If we begin to explore the ideas of deep roots of technology, we can see that if hominins were using their mouth as a sort of accessory tool, that capacity changed very early on in our evolutionary history. Here you can see an Ardipithecus dentition overprinted on top of a modern chimpanzee. Although the form of these teeth clearly have social functions, their capacity as a sort of an accessory tool clearly is quite diminished even over 4 million years ago. This may be where the use of tools to modify sources outside the mouth began to appear on the behavioral repertoire of hominins. Recently, Thompson and colleagues noted that our current models of how and when humans start using tools to access different dietary items is not really well supported by the evidence. She and her colleagues argued that kleptoparasitism, which is basically uh, stealing from carnivores that stash uh, carcasses in trees like leopards, isn't really a viable strategy for hominins. They suggest that a scenario where percussive tools are used alongside sharp edge tools prior to the full on adoption of chipstone tools makes a lot more sense. This may actually be a better explanation for the patterns that we see in the Pliocene archaeological record. Unfortunately, there's really a dearth of localities where we can find stone tools in association with any kind of modified bones prior to two million years ago. One such locality where we can explore the relationship between stone tools and diet is a two million year old assemblage of FWJJ20 from northern Kenya on the east side of the Lake Turkana Basin. This locality includes a number of fossil bones with cut marks in association with about 3,000 artifacts. It's well dated to about two million years ago. Interestingly enough, although there are a number of large mammalian bones found in association with the stone tools, there are also a number of turtle and fish bones found in association with the same deposit. We often assume that large mammals are the main focus of the earliest technology. 
However, very few of the mammal bones recovered from the excavation include surface modifications. When we looked at the balance of the bones that included modifications, we realized that many of them were actually on animals that we don't usually associate with the human diet. Indeed, many animals that had human modifications on their bones are actually reptile and fish bones, something that's rarely explored in human evolution. It is possible that hominin technology may not have been focused necessarily on large mammalian carcasses, but actually on just expanding the diet to a variety of different food resources. So what if technology is just expanding the diet of hominins beyond an already diverse primate dietary adaptation? New advances in isotope geochemistry allow us a complementary window into the hominin diet at this time. Recently, Dave Patterson and colleagues reviewed the patterns of diets within the hominins of the Turkana Basin using carbon isotopes. He noted that even though some lineages exist across major shifts in these ecosystems, there doesn't always appear to be consequent shifts in the diet for all hominins. Different lineages react differently across different time spans. It's interesting to note these changes, but carbon isotopes are somewhat limited in their applicability of tr to, uh, to describe trophic level changes. So how else might we explore these changes in diet at the onset of the appearance of stone tools? One new avenue of research that's got amazing promise is the topics in biogeochemistry associated with nitrogen isotopes. Colleagues uh, Tina Ludicky and Jeff Leichleiter at Mainz and Senckenberg Institute have actually developed a new method for extracting trace amounts of nitrogen from dental enamel. This gives us a chance to actually explore patterns of trophic level change in diet and hominins in the deep past. This may provide us the nuances we need to understand how technology may represent changes in terms of its impact on hominin ecology in the past. There are initial indications of applying this technique to isotopes in dental enamel and ancient assemblages clearly distinguishes between carnivores, omnivores, and herbivores. This will provide critical information about dietary shifts in hominins in the past. It will be particularly important as we begin to look at patterns in the deep past as to whether or not hominins in places like West Turkana and the Afar, where supposedly the onset of tool use occurs, if those hominins show changes in their in the trophic level. For example, we might expect that Pliocene hominins that only use technology ephemerally may show similar trophic level changes to omnivores, whereas if these hominins actually have a technology-assisted diet associated with a variety of uh, higher trophic level foods, we may see changes that we might expect closer towards uh, carnivore-like adaptations. If hominins are changing their dietary ecology, what are the implications for the ecosystems they live in? Recent advances in quantitative paleoecology allow us to model the possible competition between species in ancient ecosystems. Models of food webs can be informed by isotopic measures to understand the relative levels of carnivory among hominins. We can see that there are very different relationships between the diversity of predators and prey between 3 million years ago and 1 million years ago in the Turkana Basin. The question is whether stone tool use is related to these ecological changes. Tool use is clearly a hallmark of our species, yet we now know that many primates use tools. Recent reviews of the hand morphology of hominoids suggest that our hand is actually quite primitive and that may have been similar to many of our primate ancestors. Given this, maybe it's actually more likely that tool use existed in multiple disparate lineages in the past. How and why this appears to have flourished in our species may be one of the critical questions that archeologists can begin to answer. To do so though, we likely need to expand our idea of what constitutes tool use among our hominoid ancestors. Returning now to our phylogeny and link between species and technology, our findings from the earliest Oldowan suggest that different trajectories of tool use could arise and disappear and may not be related. At present, we don't have any evidence of tool use between 2.6 and 3.3 million years ago, so it's difficult to determine if there are or are not any connections. 
We hypothesize that tool use is not uncommon in the Haman lineage and may appear and disappear multiple times. But our narrow definition of tool use as sharp edge flakes to cut meat from large mammal bones is far too restrictive. We need to widen our search image to allow for greater diversity of adaptations in the past. To do this, we're probably gonna need new techniques and also may mean that some of the features we consider to be unique to humans, for example, high fidelity information transfer, may have evidence deeper back in time, but we're probably gonna need a lot more field work to answer this. I wanna thank the Interdisciplinary Center for the Archeology span and Evolution of Human Behavior for inviting me to participate in this talk series. I'm very much looking forward to Zhuo's talk and the subsequent discussion. I also wanna thank the organizations and funding agencies that make this work possible. In particular, the National Museums of Kenya and the Authority for Research and Conservation of Cultural Heritage in Ethiopia. I also wanna thank my colleagues, the Max Planck Society, funding from the National Science Foundation and the Humboldt Foundation, as well as the British Academy for supporting this work. As the pandemic appears to be winding down, hopefully, I'm looking forward to getting back out and seeing our colleagues in Kenya, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and South Africa. And I'm hopefully looking forward to seeing all of you at some kind of conference or organization sometime in the future. Thanks again for listening. Hello everyone, Hola Toj, and thank you all for being here today. First, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at ECAREB for organizing these very interesting and exciting dialogues, and also I'd like to thank them for inviting me today to join the topic on the origins of stone tool use. It's an honor to me to chair this dialogue with such an expert as David, and to have the opportunity to debate various aspects of past uh, human st uh, stone tools. Although I'm always keen and ready for a chat on this topic, it's a pleasure to follow up on David's talk by debating some of his main ideas. I must say that several of the papers published by David during the last years, and there are many, have been my daily research inspiration, especially those focusing on raw material variability and how these influence stone tool use. But on this topic, I will get back later in my talk. So my role here today is to provide what I would call between commas a provocative approach on the study of stone tool use, with emphasis on the methods and techniques used on these studies. So for the part two of the dialogue, which I call new challenges and new questions, I'll try to address some of the questions David discussed, and at the same time highlight how these can be tackled through an interrelated and complementary approach, and consequently how by answering this we can better understand the technological dynamics of past humans. I also would like to share with you my personal perspective and experience on this research topic by debating some opinions, ideas, and especially questions and believe me, I have plenty of them that keep intriguing me every day in the lab and in the field. By doing so, I also look forward for a stimulating debate with David and with you all. I hope our talks today will highlight some remaining issues in the field, main research questions, new data, results, and hopefully also postulate some potential uh, study avenues that aim to provide answers, or at least research tools, for understanding major behavioral traits in the evolution of the genosome. So focusing on my talk now, today, while picking up on the topics presented by David, my talk will be focusing on three main parts. Part one will address questions such as why investigating stone-based technologies are important to identify and understand major human behavioral traits in the past, or when, how, and why humans in the past change, modify, invented, and also maintain their technological toolkit. In part two, I'll try to give you my personal perspective on how to tackle these questions, or at least how I think this can, be poten can potentially be tackled. How can we study stone tool use? What are the main limitations of the methods and techniques applied? And how can methodological developments, including new theoretical agendas, contribute to challenge those two limitations? All of these will be discussed in further detail in part three, in which I will debate an innovative research agenda ambitious perhaps, but also encouraging, that is characterized by, by a complementary and interdisciplinary approach that aims to improve the way researchers collaborate and share data. So how do I look at these questions and these research topics? From my perspective, investigating Pleistocene archaeology is crucial, 
It allows us to contextualize the different processes involved on the evolution of human behavior and understand the human condition by focusing on the reconstruction of actions and the decoding of underlying behavior. It seems to me that questions such as how did we get here? Which technological decisions, inventions and developments made in the past made us who we are today? These questions always have been in our minds and on the minds of the ones who are intrigued about the reasons we study tiny pieces of rocks and bones. So, Pleistocene archaeology has a fundamental contribution to detecting, tracing and contextualizing the evolution of human behavior over time. We all know that from the early hominins, technology was always marked by tools made of different materials. Among these, stone tool-based technologies were the main component in past humans' toolkit. These tools were crucial for daily life activities of undergathered based populations. So in this sense, it seems to me that investigating the hominids act in the past through the study of all kinds of evidence left on, the, on stone tools is a key area of research for understanding major human behaviors. So what can technological changes tell us about changes on human behavior? From the archaeological record, technological and typological shifts describe major steps on human evolution. For example, some researchers have tried to show that aspects such as raw material, technology and tool type variability are a clear evidence for unceasing seeking at tool efficiency through mechanisms of cultural transmission. Following this discussion, these changes can act as the main argument for the application of the cumulative cultural evolutionary model in past human evolutionary studies. However, as we all know, from the archaeological record can be tricky and challenging. In fact, the hominin evolutionary record is constructed from unequal data in time and space, in which stone tool variability, and sorry for the provocative note, likely reflect a non-linear cumulative growth. But while this is certainly a topic that deserves its own dialogue and potentially hours of discussion, my point is that understanding on how and why humans modify innovate, design and use daily tools at different scales of analysis and comparison is important and needed to get a clear knowledge of the microevolutionary processes behind major human evolutionary steps. Although aspects of tool production and design heavily rely on tool use, to what use hominins put their tools and how these vary in time and space still missing in major key steps in the evolution of human behavior. So why did humans change their technology? From the earliest manifestations of technology to modern societies, technology have enabled humans to express, communicate and develop new ways of language. And we have seen and discussed this during the talk by Susanna Carvalho and Robert Foley. These technologies play a fundamental role in the acquisition of different resources and are known as a representative of the many daily living activities such as stone-tipped spears for hunting and chipped stone tools for butchering. In fact, technological changes were and still are a key factor in the dynamics of human societies, raising questions such as how and why those changes took place in early populations and how people were able to survive and expand based on their technological traditions, innovations and novelties. What is also interesting and fascinating is that at the same time technologies also reflect cultural transmission, learning mechanisms, ethnicity and social status patterns, allowing the recognition and interpretation of different traits in the evolution and expansion of human behavior. We have heard from David Stock that the transmission of, of information and knowledge is key to our evolutionary process. In this sense, stone tool variability is seen as reflecting evolutionary process of technological and cultural transmission through which new behavioral traits are modified, innovated, accumulated and ultimately lost. But do we know when, why and how these changes occur? Can we always identify and trace these changes in the variability seen in the archaeological record? Although all needs are highly dependent on technology, as mentioned by David, the origins and changes on stone tools have little to do with the selective capability of, of hominids. In fact, from my point of view, this correlation between hominins and tool forms has worked as enormous bias in our, on our understanding of technological changes. So even more important, how to see these changes? How are these visible in archaeological assemblages? Changes on stone tool use can occur at different levels. Let's take an example here. 
Let's imagine that I'm looking for a stone tool that aims to scrape all the grease and the remaining bits of flesh from a, a, an animal hide, which I need to use in order to protect me from winter. First, I will look for a raw material that is more suitable for the job, probably one that would not damage the hide at first, or that would not break after only a few movements. Potentially, I will also be keen on designing and consequently producing a tool that is efficient for the job, but at the same time lasts longer. During use, I might need to retouch it or resharpen it, because the edge is dull, full of grease, or it broke in the meanwhile. All these aspects are fundamental when I plan which tool I want to use, and in which way I want to design this given tool. Why is that? Because at the end of the day I'm lazy, and therefore I want to be efficient on my daily tasks. But what if among my group, technological efficiency is not even considered? What if my relatives always told me that raw material A should be the one to be used, no matter what? Or if we should always use a given tool form, the so-called Swiss knife? Well, maybe efficiency and durability not really matter here, but rather my social and cultural identity prevails. This might sound a bit bizarre, but don't we see this on nowadays undergathered communities? Or on our nowadays behavior? As I try to show how these forms uh, are made and used are key to understand the evolutionary mechanisms of human behavior. So how all these uh, aspects are visible and can we detect these on stone tools or assemblage of stone tools and can we investigate them? Over the last decades, uh, archaeological research has focused on different aspects of prehistoric tool related behaviors of past humans such as the procurement, procurement of raw material diversification and manufacturing techniques, such as technology and typology, the manipulation of physical prop properties, such as e-treatment, and actual tool use. User analysis, for example, has been the discipline that provides direct evidence on tool use through the study of characteristic patterns of microscopic and microscopic traces left on tool surface after these being used. But we do know that the formation of processes of the different types of user traces have been shown to vary in response to changes in raw material, tool morphology and design, and also on tool function, for example, an action performed on a given work material. So in fact, the study of stone tools, and especially stone tool use, is not just about the form of a given tool or the user trace found on the tool surface. It does involve much more understanding. And this is exactly the comprehensive understanding that it's needed, and that has been highlight recently highlighted by several researchers in the field of stone tool use. I took part of a recent study where we discussed the different methodological and, and interpretive approaches we used on the study of, of, of stone tool use. Among other discussed topics, this discussion led to the recommendation that the term functional analysis should assume a wider perspective, referring to a combination of methods and data that will focus research not only on assessing tool use per se, but also tool design and form. In this approach, use where data, which refers to the study of traces presented on the artifact surface that result from the wear produced by human use, is combined with aspects of tool design, which include tool morphology, intentional edge modification, retouch, and aspects of tool performance, such as suitability, durability, and efficiency. From our perspective, this approach aims at answering questions on stone tool variability and therefore on the nature and origins of the different characters that are part of the so-called complex human behavior. So in sum, we aim to address questions such as is tool variability, for example raw material and tool type, directly associated with improvement on tool performance? Do aspects of tool design such as edge angle, retouch intensity have an effect on tool efficiency? Are transitional periods in archaeological records associated with changes on tool use? And how does tool variability relate to this? When and why did humans change their technology? Or for example, other questions such as does variability observed on tools forms reflect economic, cultural or functional character of past human hunter-gatherers? How aspects of tool curation and design, for example retouch intensity, resharpening, are related to tool e efficiency and tool use? Does aspects such as tool retouch methods and retouch intensity are re directly related to aspects of tools used such as maintenance of the tool design? 
While technological and typological studies have a long tradition in technological research, useware analysis is a quite new discipline. And although its contribution is unique and of major importance on the study of tool use, its limitations have been profoundly debated by several researchers. From my perspective, this is mainly due to the premature theoretical framework of the discipline, lack of clear communication of data and results, and potentially because, as in any other disciplines, there are indeed limitations. But methodological improvements do not necessarily reject previous works, but rather aim, aim to tackle fundamental limitations. While, while some methodological shifts are technology-based, such as the micros, microscopy techniques and, and, and methods, others can be achieved by adopting clear standards and protocols already established in other fields. So it's beyond the scope of my talk today to debate all of these topics, but one that I would like to explore a bit more is the experiment. Experiments are fundamental, as highlighted previously. They can significantly contribute on this approach that look at different aspects that comprehend stone tool use. So in the recent decades, several researchers have debated the major limitations of experiments in archaeology, including functional studies, which can be categorized, for example, as the lack of clear identification, organization and definition of the control and manipulation of the different variables, the coexistence of confounding variables and the dominance of qualitative over quantitative methods. This sound too complicated, or it might sound too complicated, too involving and too restricted at the same time, but what needs to be stressed out is that if we deeply rely on experiments, then we need to look at the way we design, organize and run our experiments. So we have recently debated this and followed the discussion on the field of experiment on stone tool technology in which different levels of experimentation have been suggested in order to improve the state-of-the-art methods. So organized by different generation levels, these experiments, although complementary and crucial when constructing analogical inferences, should have different goals and seek, seek different observation and types of data. So in the case of the second generation experiments, these are focusing on questions regarding the key properties of the archaeological record. These, based on the study of physical principles, operate uniformly across space and time. Also, aim to detect patterns and build methodological and analytical units of measure. Such analytical units provide concrete data for the observed connections between the identified patterns and processes that can be used as proxy for inferring on past human behavior. In sum, these experiments seek to test individual variables and the interaction between them and the development of units of analysis and measure. And here is where the use of robots in archaeology comes in. Second generation experiments often use mechanical or automated apparatus which allow to drastically reduce human induced variability and at the same time control and manipulate variables. Although indirectly aiming to understand human behavior in the past, and unlike other levels of experiments, these do not aim to replicate human actions, but rather understand the impact and casuality of the different aspects of stone tool use, including aspects of tool design, motions, work material, and others. While using control setups in combination with sequential experiments, one can test how aspects of tool design, for example edge angle, relate to the efficiency and durability of a given form. For example, this study led by one of my PhD students is focused on understanding the variability design and use of one of the most intriguing stone tools from the late middle politic of Central Europe, the Kalmasa. These asymmetric tools are known to be very standardized in terms of production strategies, by facial retouch and edge angle. But why these tools last long in the archaeological record? And why do they show similar edge angles? Interpreted as multifunctional tools, were these tools optimally designed for several tasks and or to long-term use? In this study, sequential experiments help to tackle some of these questions, providing results on the efficiency and durability of different edge angles, as well on the suitability and efficiency of the different raw materials used to produce these tools. And interestingly enough, this study also shows uh, how the use of different raw materials relate to the efficiency and the need of retouching and resharpening the active edges. So this is just an example of experiments that test different interrelated aspects can help on the understanding of how tools were designed and used. And as highlighted before, raw materials and especially the variability seen on the properties of the different types of rocks and how those affect stone tool use needs to be taken in consideration.
So, from my perception, this perspective and lines of study should also be merged on a single approach, which combines at the same time high resolution and multi scale methods with an integrative interaction between archaeology, experiments, and methodological developments. As illustrated in this figure, this approach also implies the combination of different scales of analysis, from the morphology of the tool, to the study of some of the tool's features, such as edge angle, to the microscopy analysis of traces and residues related to use. As it involves the combination of different methods, scales, and data, this approach also requires and at the same time encourages methodological progresses, which aim to develop new ways of collecting and combining data, with emphasis on new imaging techniques. And concerning the combination and comparison between different types of data, one of the major methodological developments in the field of uh, use were is the integration between qualitative and quantitative methods and data on the analysis on the different aspects of some tool use. While aiming to, take in, to tackle some limitations of both techniques, this approach also advocates the need to include both complementary applications following the principles of multi-scale and high-resolution analysis. In this sense, although quite established on other disciplines such as engineer or dental microarray analysis, quantitative surface texture analysis has only recently been systematically applied to the study of artifacts. Here, techniques such as laser confocal microscopy have been used to ca characterize changes on microsurface texture. It has been recently shown that the formation of some types of user traces, such as polish, are caused by abrasion processes which result from the contact between the tool surface and the worked material. So by quantitatively characterizing these surface changes through the use of standardized parameters such as roughness and others, this method supported by experimental replications has shown to be crucial for the identification of diagnostic features, which can be directly correlated with different actions and worked materials. And this can also be achieved and combined at different scales, from studies on the formation and characterization of macro-edge damage to microsurface texture modifications. Here, for example, is a study developed by another PhD student of mine that focuses on the identification and characterization of user traces on groundstone tools. Based on some variability observed on a middle poetic assemblage from the Levant, the study aimed to create an experimental library that would allow for better characterization and understanding about the formation of user traces during the use of these tools to perform different tasks, such as grinding or percussive motions. When using different methods and techniques, this study was able to show that the combination of different scales of analysis is needed and fundamental, as some user traces cannot always be equally recognized or they or Diagnostic features can not be identified at all scales. Therefore, such combination and integration are much needed and should be an integrative part of the agenda of every archaeological but also experimental, experimental reference library. In this case, reference libraries are fundamental, against which archaeological centers can be compared. Also, due to these different types of data, reference libraries are also becoming more involving and complex especially due to the amount of, amount of gen, uh, data generated. Here, it's important to build guidelines concerning common language, which focus on the used terminology, but also on standards and protocols that should be followed when acquiring and processing data. Furthermore, this also involves policies in terms of sharing open access data. In fact, such libraries can be improved and used by different researchers, involving different types of data and studies on the variability seen on the archaeological record. These platforms are crucial on building common language and on improving collaborative work between researchers that are aiming at the same goal, understanding changes on the human behavior and cultural repertoire. So wrapping up my main debated topics today and following up on David's talk, I've tried to stress out how we can trace the origins of stone tools, as well as process of technological and cultural transmission. My 50 cents, so to speak, on this discussion attempts to highlight the significance of a comprehensive approach and methodology, and such approach has shown to be 
on the identification of how and why early hominins and other primates select their raw materials and how they change and adapt their technological system. To how behavioral complexity emerged and which technological systems characterize and mark such evolutionary steps. And how tool form and tool use variability can show us how humans evolved and adapt in different ways. But also how these were reflecting human decision-making processes, social, economic and cultural dynamics. And how these build the roots on the diversity and social complexity we see in the evolutionary processes of the human behavior. Although this sounds at least to me more or less clear and straightforward, it involves a lot of effort, resources and research, as well as answering many questions that every day pop up from the archaeological site and assemblages. So, so I hope my talk today, as well as David's, provide you all with some food for thought and discussion about not only the way we look at the origins of stone tools, uh, but also how we should look at these assemblages with special emphasis on the methodological approach we use to tackle all these questions. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I'm really looking forward to having some discussion, questions and comments from you. Finally, I also would like to thank to all institutions that funded and supported the research I presented here today, and also my colleagues and collaborators who have significantly contributed to most of these ideas, projects and research topics. So yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, see you all online soon. And uh, if you do not find the time to ask questions during the dialogue, please get in touch with me as I'm always happy to debate and hear similar or other perspectives on these topics. Obrigado, adeus e até já! Great, thank you very much. This was really, really, really good. Fascinating talks. Thank you, David. Thank you, João. So now we have um, our time for um, questions, comments, um, anyone? Okay, we have here, Emily, do you want to make a question? Please turn your microphone on. Hi, thanks for the really great talks. Um, you both mentioned raw material variability, but you give quite different interpretations of why raw materials vary, which is perhaps in part related to David talking about the very earliest hominins and Joao, you sort of implied you were talking about later humans. Um, in either case, in a setting where the availability of high quality and low quality rocks is similar, how do we explain why hominins or humans settled for using poorer quality rocks? Okay, João, David. You, you want to have a go, David? <laughs> but the, the, the question is why did they use poor quality rock? When better, because often you'll find um, sources of similar, similar availability, but you'll find there is use of poor quality rock. So why, why do people do that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, the thing is, I think it's hard to say, poor or good quality, right? Um, because qualities are not, there's a variety of different qualities that make up why a tool is used, right? And so I, I've always thought about it as a way of saying, you know, there, you know, there's rebound heart, there's some kind of mechanical property of a tool and that varies. And then the selection for it is dependent on what it's used for, and then also availability, right? So for example, I mean, I mean, it's not a great example because it's not chip stone tools, but um, when, we, when we did this experiment with the chimpanzees, we gave them, you know, a variety of different options, right? You know, from the worst to the, to the best. And we thought, oh, well, the deaf are gonna, you know, they're eventually gonna figure it out and they're gonna just select the good ones. What we didn't realize is that actually the worst rock that we gave them, which is effectively chalk, makes a divot in the tool. And that was really important to be able to stabilize the nut, right? So that was the worst quality rock, but yet it was selected over and over and over again, right? So, you know, it, why select poor quality rocks might be because in that particular context, that makes, that's the best decision, right? And, and, that, and that decision can be driven by, you know, 
what's available or it can be driven by, you know, just need, right? So especially when something is good enough, right? Like at Kanjara South, we did all those different rock properties. The vast majority of artifacts made there are made of, on, on an awful rock, but it's everywhere. So why not use it, right? Makes no sense to walk six kilometers to get something if something that's just good enough is there. I mean, that's my take on it. Yeah, I would, I would generally agree with uh, with David. I think we uh, we've we, we've been always discussing this dichotomy between you know good quality and bad quality rocks, which is mainly you know these these two groups of uh, fine uh, grain and coarse grain uh, raw materials. And I, I mean, my perspective on this is I tend to, as 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 you run uh, experiments, uh, you know, and 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 you and you check the results, you, you you tend to 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 think that one type of rock might be good for you know to for napping, you know, to 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 produce a certain tool form, but the same type of raw material might not might not be good to perform a certain a given task, you know, might not be efficient enough. So, and this is where the properties of the rocks come in, you know? So, so there are certain properties that, that might uh, facilitate and, and help uh, a napper to produce a very uh, interesting and very fancy and well-designed stone tool. But when it turns to scrape eyed or, you know, uh, cut a bone or smash a bone, maybe the same uh, raw material is not so suitable or not so much efficient anymore. So, I guess it depends how you it depends how you define um, raw material uh, quality here, um, and 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 that's that is highly dependent how you quantify the, the, the that that quality you know those 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 properties. Um, yeah, I've seen in many experiments that the, the the raw materials that we tend to believe that are the good ones you know like obsidian like flint and so forth for certain tests they are not the most efficient ones. <laughs> you know, and this is really this really related to the to their to their properties. You know, because they they just break very easily because they need to be retouched very often because at some point they become dull, as I tried to show in the talk. You know, while for example, coarse grain raw materials, you know, they don't need that much of attention, so to say. You know, you, they just keep going and they they are quite efficient. And uh, I don't know. It's I guess it depends how you how you look at it. Uh, which is tricky because it's also tricky to measure raw materials, raw material uh, properties. It's really, it's really tricky. <laughs> Thanks, you both gave different perspectives on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have another question from Corey Johnson. Corey, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yes. Um, thank you both uh, for the wonderful talks. Get me. Up early in the morning, um, I guess in my part of the world. Anyway, um, so my, I have two questions, and I think both of you will be able to answer them. Um, the first one is, uh, or to contribute to them, are there temporal limits to different kinds of lithic use wear traces um, due to general taphonomic processes in the archaeological record? Um, and the second question is, how can uh, designing excavation methods um, better accommodate the recovery of use wear data? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, it it is known that that postpositional process and taphonomic process have a, have a, a significant impact on the preservation of user traces. I mean, that's 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 true. And um, I'm not sure if there's a there's a temporal limit on that. I I think it's Highly dependent on archaeological deposit and on the on the on the on the formation process of the deposit. Um, so, in in terms of in terms of excavation methods, I mean, um, the way you storage the lithics is quite fundamental. I mean, we uh, we recently, I mean, the use wear is basically the result of abrasion. So, from from a tribological perspective, is the contact between two surfaces, sometimes with the third body between the two. Um, so basically, every time there's contact and there's a harder material, there's, 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 there's use wear, there's abrasion. So in, of course, you should try to avoid it. But um, the, 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 
the interesting thing about Useware is, is and sometimes I think that's what I meant by the lack of communication of the results is that it is not just about the identification of the polish or the identification of the Useware per se, but is looking at patterns, how they are located at the stone tools, in which stone tools they are located, you know, how they are distributed. So it's, it's a more, you know, uh, um, yeah, holistic and, um, and it involves a bit more of just saying, okay, there's, there's a Useware here and there. Um, just to give an example on excavation methods, and then I'll give the word to David. I we recently we recently published a paper where, where we try to evaluate our uh, brushing and rubbing with our hands stone tools how that affect um, the user or how, how that affect the uh, the surface of, of of the tool, and we've we've shown that that it, it really does affect. So we need to be careful, and we need to to. I mean, as any other techniques, I mean, I think many, many decades ago, we were not uh, looking at uh, uh, sediment analysis. So we were not keeping the sediments. And we nowadays don't know that, that these are crucial. So there are kind of, that's what I mean. There are some kind of guidelines and recommendations that should, uh, what could be followed uh, in order to prevent a little bit this, this the phenomic processes. Okay, David, I don't know if you have a word to say. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know if there is a I mean theoretically it makes sense to me that the that these uh, that these word traces would be available as far back as as there are stone tools, um, but uh, why they actually haven't been applied to the earlier part of the record I don't really know I mean there's a few early uh, uh, attempts at this like Nick Toff and uh applying it to some of some of those early assemblages but subsequently it, it hasn't been i'm sure for some assemblages um mechanical and chemical breakdown of images definitely has has an impact on it but you know for some rock types you know rhyolites and things like that i mean you know those rocks have been around for billions of years so uh they shouldn't break down you know in the next less couple of million years um so I would see that as being a, a sort of, it sh if it's there, we should be able to find it. Um, but one of the things I would say is that uh, we don't we don't probably have enough intersection between um, people who study sort of micromorphology um, and, the, and the artifact analysis in the sense of there are really detailed components of the sedimentology um, and the micro environments around artifacts that I think, you know, when we just, you know, ascribe it to a layer, we may not uh, be getting at the details um, that we probably maybe need in order to understand the impact on, on uh, surface morphology, right? You know, saying that this isn't a, a, you know, a clay layer is fine as long as it, it's not in the one part of the clay layer that also has gravels in it, right? So, um, so I think maybe, connecting those two things, the sort of micromorphology and the, and I, I was, it was, we don't usually work with micromorphologists in, in the early part of the record. So it was really fantastic to have Vera Aldej add to our, our sites. And she actually caught an artifact in one of her uh, samples. And it was really interesting to see the, the, um, the actual micro environment around the artifact. So maybe uh, enhancing that might be a good, a good way to look at that. Awesome, thank you both. Thank you. Um, I guess we have a question from Carlos Ferreira. Carlos. Hello, good afternoon, yes. Um, I would like, to, first of all, to start by thanking you both for your fantastic presentations. And I would like to take this opportunity and your experience to ask the following question regarding the relationship between biology and technology. Basically, if it is possible by analyzing the paleoanthropological record, to signal physical changes in these hominids with the appearance of stone tool use. And if we can understand if these changes precede the diffusion of stone tool use, or if they are slightly posterior. My idea is that with the emergence of lithic technology, new systematic gestures and certain positions typic, typical of napping activities were incorporated, which may have had an impact on the upper limbs, for example. In other words, if the physical adaptations are a consequence of the behavioral adaptations. Um, I, I was wondering if the paleoanthropological record can tell us anything about that, but I am also aware that uh, uh, this question is conditioned by the fact that 
we know very few Pliocene industries and we know even fewer human fossils for this period, but I would like to know your opinion on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, David, João. <laughs> Go ahead, David. That's for you. That, this one is for you, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, absolutely, it would be fantastic to make those connections uh, between the biology. I mean, ultimately, right? Like, so, and that it, it actually, your question is great because it gets to the heart of it. Of it. Like, archaeology is really just a way of studying human, uh, ancient human biology. Right? You know, it's just a component of human biology. And we should be really focused on this idea of how do we study, how, how is archaeology actually just a study of behavior that is the overall package of the biology of ancient hominids, right? Um, the sort of silos that we put ourselves into is probably not all that, all that useful. And this idea of trying to connect the two is great. It, and it's not done that often because it's so hard. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that would really be great, uh, you know, first of all, some people are doing this, right? Like, so um, people like uh, Aaron Marie Williams and Alistair Key, you know, they, they're doing these kinds of experiments that uh, get at, you know, what is it about the morphology of hands and things like that, that impact how tools are used, right? And we probably need more of those. Um, actually applications to the archeological record are harder, right? Because most of them are done on modern humans. Uh, we can't really, you know, it's like, well, what happens if they have a shorter thumb or a longer finger, right? You know, um, and so uh, it's gonna be more difficult to make those, uh, make that leap from the biology to, to the to the archaeology, but I think one of the things, and it's one of the things I, I really like about your question, is this: is this, you know, what if we had a fantastic fossil, fossil record, and what if we had a fantastic archaeological record? What what if we had both of those things? How would we actually answer? Uh, start beginning to uh, ask those questions, and I think you know we have to use like a variety of different contextual data, which is why I'm really excited about the isotope uh, work. Um, because the possibility of, you know, coming at that from a different perspective um, and saying, okay, like we know from the biology of these animals that we should see these changes. So, you know, what is, what is it we might, we might expect to see from the behavior? And then the same thing maybe with the, with the tool use as well. Here are the changes in the biology of, of, of the hand morphology, for example, of the, of the, uh, of the, of the hominins. Uh, what might we expect from the behavior on, on, the, on that side? Um, and at least starting to ask some of those questions, um, because I think it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it will always be initially very um, hypothetical. But if we don't start there, um, I, I think we, we relegate ourselves to really just, you know, asking questions about rocks or asking questions about hominids and not actually making those connections. Um, so, uh, and that's a long-winded way of saying it's like, it's really an interesting topic and one that I think we should strive for, even if it is really hard. So, I'm sorry if that's like a non-answer, um, no, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I just, um, you know, how to, how to actually go about it. Uh, I think, you know, starting off with some of those experiments and then really, you know, should try to develop some hypotheses and then getting down into the sort of nitty gritty of the fine grained analysis of the artifacts as well as the, the, as the hominid biology. And maybe the, the micro is gonna get at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. João, I don't know if you wanna say something about this. No, I think, I think David's uh, reply was pretty convincing to me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, now we have a question from Jonathan Sale. Hope I pronounced this okay. Yes, yes. Thanks, Dave. Um, thanks, Joao. Very interesting talks. Um, the question I have is for Dave. And um, well, I told that you haven't um, highlighted the amount of problem we have in terms of um, geochronological control for many of the, the sites, particularly for, for the evidence from the Pliocene in terms of bone modification marks from the Kika and the Lomequan. We have um, 
several works that are criticizing this, this um, the evidence for this and the fact that these are isolated, um, isolated uh, lines of evidence or isolated cases. Um, the fact that there hasn't been enough field investigation for this, um, for this uh, um, bodies of evidence um, has been uh, very troubling for many of us, including myself. Um, and so when you say that you, in fact, think that probably tool making um, stretches back um, to the Miocene um, by looking at, of course, the, the, the biological and biomechanical uh, evolutionary signals. I, my, my thinking is that we haven't even resolved the issues we have in the Pliocene. We have two isolated cases, and these are very problematic. There are published works um, that strongly criticize them. And, and I think for Dikika, even the, the um, initial researchers, um, to a large extent, agree with the problematic nature of the, the evidence. So, and, and, and in relation to that also, let's say for um, RD and uh, both Ramides and Kadaba, we have been conducting field work for many, many years. And, and even before me, the projects have been doing field work for several decades and they haven't had um, a single indication of tool use. And do you think they haven't been looking hard enough or, I mean, why is there no evidence this far? Yeah, I, mean, I definitely would, we need to highlight the fact that, that there are significant difficulties with both the Kika and, and with uh, um, uh, and with Lomaqui. I'd be the first one to, you know, I mean, uh, I thought that uh, Will Archer's recent paper on the Lomaqui is, brings up, you know, significant difficulties and we, and things that, you know, not beyond the possibility of it being able to be uh, resolved, but need to be resolved. And the same thing at Dikika, it's a single specimen on the surface, right? Um, very different from the vast majority of our archaeological collections. Um, but I think the, the, the point I was trying to make there is that, I mean, that we, there are no really good reasons to believe that, that earlier hominins aren't using tools. In fact, I would go so far as to say, you know, given what we know about chimpanzees and a variety of other different primates, they were almost certainly using tools, right? Now they might have been using a variety of organic tools that don't preserve, right? You know, we we know all kinds of, you know, we macaques, capuchins, a variety of different primates use tools. Um, baboons, to a certain extent, use behaviors that can be considered tool use, um, but they don't leave any 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 archaeological record. Right. Um, so to say that they weren't using tools from the absence of evidence is a little bit, you know, okay, we can't can't prove it. We also can't prove it. It wasn't there. And and I think in that sense, we have we ha we have narrowed our focus way too far. We have, we said, okay, if we don't have this kind of tool that looks exactly like this, and we don't have marks that look exactly like this, then they weren't using tools. And I think that maybe is restricting us too much, right? It may end up, you know, we may end up being like coming up with the conclusion of we, they could be using tools and theoretically they might be, we just don't know because we can't find the evidence. But as of right now, my impression is that our just, you know, our search engine is chipstone tools, cut marks on bones, um, and on large mammalian bones. And if you were to take that same search image and apply it to many primates, they don't use tools, but we can go out in there and view them they doing it, right? So the, the problem is that we need, may need to modify our search image. I, I don't think that the people who are working in, in the Miocene or, or working in, in early Pliocene deposits just haven't been looking hard enough. I think maybe that their search image for these things is looking for very specific things that, that if we were to, like I said, if we were to apply it to modern primates, we wouldn't. They, we would say these these primates don't don't use tools, even though we can observe them today using tools, right? You know. So, for example, the 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 use of tortoises and breaking them against uh, against trees, you know, that's a 
or breaking them open with, uh, with tools, right? There's almost no actual classic archaeological evidence of it, but they're clearly using tools. So the, so the question is, how can we, in, uh, in a con constructive fashion, modify our search image and be ready for the possibility that, yeah, that there is no tool use earlier on, but at present, if we limit ourselves to cut marks on large mammal bones and, sh and uh, flake stone tools, I think we're limiting ourselves to a portion of the, of the tool use repertoire that by, by the standards of, of modern primates doesn't hold up. Modern primates use a variety of tools that have no archeological record and use, do, produce some things that we're not looking for. So I think in that sense, that's all I'm really, um, trying to say is not that 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 we that those people haven't been looking hard enough or that there isn't that that stuff uh is there and they just not you know aren't, aren't able to find it but that maybe we're just not looking for the right things right now and and largely because we don't even have the tool sets or the experimental sets to even develop what those things look like um and you know and i, I that that's what i i was trying to focus on and I, but I will say that I agree with you 100% that the actual taphonomic details of those earlier assemblages, one cut mark bone and, uh, and, and the, what we know of Lamequi right now is not sufficient to be able to say there is definitely Pliocene tool use. But I think saying there isn't Pliocene tool use because we haven't found it there um, is equally as flawed. Right, because we maybe haven't actually developed what it is we're looking for. We're still looking for the same things, and they may not be doing that. Thanks. I have another one for Joe. Can I ask? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, my my question to you is: How much um, can we distinguish between multiple um, functions on a tool on a single tool? So for example, if a tool was used as a projectile uh, weapon and also as a knife, would we be able to um, distinguish between the superimposed functional traces and identify that there were these functional uh, sequences that were that the tool was used for? Oh, Jonathan, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question and difficult to answer. Um, so I mean, it, it depends. It depends on the. It depends how the use were distributed and located on the tool surface. So, I mean, it, it's it, it depends what kind of use were we're talking about. So you mentioned projectiles, and then after being used for hunting, you know, be at the tool because the tip of the tool is broken, and therefore there is a that what we would call a diagnostic impact fracture, and so it's not suitable anymore for, for, for to be used as a projectile, but it can be used as a knife, for example, or a scraper. So in that case, you would have two different types of user traces, you know, and potentially located at different, um, uh, you know, uh, located at different uh, spots on the tool. So that would be kind of uh, possible to identify. And, and, and people have, have, have seen this. And then there are several studies that have shown that um, this is the case. And, and this is a good example of projectiles that after I use for as a knives or or knives that that, that, that are also uh, used for for scraping or there's this um, use um, you know of, of scraping and cutting on the same tool, um, but this is only possible when you do have different types of views where <clears throat> located on different spots on the tool surface, as I just mentioned. I mean, what can happen as well on on it happens on dental uh, microanalysis is that the the surface that you see is basically the result of the last uh, abrasion process, you know? So, I mean, that's when people would do, that do dental microwear, the surface that they scan, it refers to the last meal of the animal, basically. So here, if, if, we, if we have several, you know, uh, abrasion processes, which result from the, from the tool use on top of each other, I mean, it's very likely that you'll see the last one. But this, is, this, is, this gets pretty tricky when you have, um, when you have, when, well, if you, if the you, if the tool was used to, for example, to scrape different types of material, which have different hardness. So, and in that sense, they will produce different types of useware. In this case, different types of polish. 
So that's why we had sometimes when you look at polishes, we don't find them diagnostic or we say that can be A or B or C. And in those cases, we are potentially look at, looking at these uh, scenarios where there's a, a you know, um, where there are different types of user on top of each other, or, or there's, it's just dif difficult to, to, to identify. And I mean, this is not just the case when there are overlap between uh, different types of user, but for example, it happens also with the tough mapping processes. When, you know, when post the positional process, they mask the, the, the user that originally was on the surface. So yes and no, <laughs> it kind of depends a little bit what you're looking at. But it has been shown that people were, you know, using their tools and reusing it, and sometimes uh, actually to 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 use them on, on different for different purposes, basically. Thank you, João, and thank you, David, of course, and thank you, Jonathan, for for the questions. Um, any more questions? I don't see any. Raised hands, no. Okay, I guess uh, before we say goodbye, um, I would like to invite you for our next and uh, unfortunately last session of the ICAREP Dialogues, which is scheduled for the July 16th, um, and which, which is going to be about the origins of agriculture. And our uh, speakers will be Dr. Darian Fuller as our guest researcher and Dr. Hugo Oliveira from ICAREB. Um, I guess you can already register for the, that session um, at ICAREB's uh, website. Um, so it was a true pleasure to have you all here today. Thank you all very much for your participation. And of course, a special thank you to the David and Joao for such uh, an interesting presentations. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you all in, uh, in one month. For, the, for our last session. Thank you guys.